Hello, this is Leisha Holmes of Key Recruitment and I'm absolutely thrilled to be joined today by a very familiar face with those of you who followed us for quite some time because I've actually been a guest for this gentleman on his own podcast. This is Sean Anderson, who's the CEO of Hoxo Media. How are you today, Sean? I'm well, I'm well. Thanks for uh, having me on. It's always a bit strange being on the other side of the microphone, so uh, I'm quite, quite excited to, to be asked questions rather than be asking the question. Well, you never know. We might turn it the other way. But this was yeah. you actually d delivering on a promise that you made to me when I came on your show, of course, on the Rag Podcast. I asked I actually, you, I actually asked you live, didn't I? I asked you. You said, am I coming on your show? And I said, yes, please. I made it. So for those that live possibly under a rock who aren't familiar with who you are, could you give us an introduction as to who you are and what you do? Yeah, sure. So um, as you said, Sean Anderson, I'm the... CEO founder of Hoxo Media. We're a, an inbound marketing agency that exclusively works with recruitment businesses around the world. So we, um, we, we help recruiters both at a desk level and at an agency level uh, build brands that win business effectively. So um, we started the business, I started the business with a business partner three and a half years ago. Uh, we, we, we celebrated our three year anniversary the day before, well, it was like the week before the coronavirus smashed in March. Mm. It's quite weird seeing our, I've got, I was looking through my phone at the three year party we did. Mm. And we did this like, you know, projection of the year four. And it was like, honestly, that was like 6th of March. And a week on the 17th, I think we shut the office. So it's like, it feels like pre-COVID and post-COVID are like, they're almost the same amount of time, like three years and six months. It's like, I don't know, it's hard. 13 years, hasn't it? It's been forever. Yeah, it's nuts. But, um, so yeah, we, I've got kind of two main focuses. I, 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 we have an academy business where we train recruiters and recruitment owners and leaders um, on, on the benefits of personal branding and how to produce content, how to get the most out of LinkedIn. And then at a company level, we manage the brands of recruitment businesses as well. So we produce the content, we, we provide the team, we come up with the budget, we produce all the content, we integrate with like systems and processes, and then we effectively serve leads back to, to recruiters. So um, we, uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're in a pretty uh, interesting space. I feel like we were one of the first, if not the first, to pop up doing this. There was quite a few independent people when we started. And now, now it's getting quite a noisy space, which is quite yeah, interesting. You, that, that you've got to make the most noise then, haven't you? But obviously, this, you didn't always do this. So tell us a little bit about your life before Hoxo. Yeah, so I was a recruiter for about seven years. Um, previously a school teacher. So I was a PE teacher for three and a half years. And then I went traveling, went to Australia. And I got into recruitment in, in Melbourne, in Randstad. And then I did just under two years there. I moved back to, moved to, well, moved back, moved to London. Um, in the Olympics, and then I did five five years at a company called Venquis, who are uh, were a startup business transformation recruiter, and I, I was their top billing consultant, manager, leader, and uh, I left in end of January 2017 with yeah with uh, the plan for two years was to, to launch a recruitment company called Hoxo, so I planned it for two years, and then maybe four, six weeks before I changed my mind and launched a marketing agency, having never worked in marketing in my life. Changed. What made you sort of take that size? Oh, it's, a long, so it's a story I've told a lot of times, but in a, in a, to tell it in the shortest way possible, I, I was getting frustrated with the way we were doing what we were doing. So I was, I was in a business of about 56 people. I ran the UK contract business and my business partner now, my best mate also, like he worked alongside me. We managed about 20 odd people between us and we were, we were driving like, a lot of contract deals, but I don't know, I just hated the whole 10 before 10 calling your hiring manager bullshit. I just didn't like it. Like, I, I don't know. And, and I, I got into podcasts, like not being a podcaster, but listening to podcasts back in 2015. And that led me on a journey to like watching a lot of YouTube and Instagram. And I was just, I don't know, I just found like, I was connecting with these people and brands through ways that they'd never needed to phone me, but I was buying shit off them all the time. So I remember coming into work going like, we should be doing more with social media. And everyone was just like, shut up, like, what are you talking about? And, and then I, when I start, and then I was looking to leave. So I looked into my restrictive covenant period in my contract, which was six months and it was very strict. And I really respected my, my, my bosses. So I was not really going to break it, but I had this brainwave. What if I produced content for six months? It's not in my contract. There's nothing in my contract. So 
if I produce like video or written words or whatever on LinkedIn, this was 2016, by the way, like no one was doing this shit on LinkedIn. Um, I was like, no one in, everyone in my market in insurance will see me and know all about Hoxo. And then when it, when my covenant ends, you can well, just go for it. It'll, yeah, it'll be like, you know, people will be like, Oh, you know what you're up to anyway. But I went out to find a company that could help me and I couldn't find it. There was no marketing agency that the, the ones that were like the cool social agencies weren't excited about a startup recruitment company and the budgets we wanted to spend. And the guys that were doing bits and bobs in the industry, I just was underwhelmed by it. I was like, it's just completely flat stuff. So I basically hired a guy myself, a mate of mine, and I was ready to go. And then I spoke to a few other recruitment agency owners that I knew, and they were like, we'll buy that. Yeah. And I was like, buy what? And they were like, whatever you're going to do, if it works, we'll buy it. But I ended up selling five contracts before I even started. And I didn't even know what I was, I was just sold a dream, like an idea. So I was like, I've got, to, I've got to back this up now. So that is a long way of saying, but I, I literally decided last minute, like we'd already registered the company, bought Bullhorn. We were a recruitment company. Yeah. And then I decided, nah, I'm going to try this for six months. And if it don't work, I'll just go back to what I know. That's what you know. Yeah. Um, and if you watch on YouTube, like we documented everything. We did a, we made an episode of something called Hoxo Life, which actually ran all the way till lockdown. And then we've, We've not been able to do it digitally, but we filmed and vlogged every month from the start. So you can go back on YouTube on Hoxo Media, look at okay. April 20, 2017. You can see the shit we were doing, like walking around London, three of us just, you know, in this bubble. so excited. Yeah, in this excited. And it was, it was great. But, but the biggest thing about it back then was education was so, so low. No one knew any, no one cared. No, people were, no, no. That's a lie. No one cared. I got loads of interest, but no one wanted to spend any money on it. They were just like, what is this? What are you talking about? Like you everyone thought different to what recruiters had always done that mm. know, recruiters generally don't like change. You, you know, recruitment is you tell you do tele sales effectively to get new business. You then do the same reverse to get your candidate. So to do this, it would have been totally not the norm. Well, I just thought LinkedIn had to go like social, like the Facebook and Insta. And I'd seen Facebook go from organic, like you could have loads of mates and you could put a post up and people would all, and then it became flat and it was all paid. And then Insta took off and you, anyone with a massive Instagram following now built that in the early days. And then that started to go. This, so LinkedIn, I was like, it's got to be similar. They've got a cat. And then when Microsoft invested in LinkedIn, I was like, there's going to be a change here. And so I started producing my own videos in April, 2017. I, I had this like KPI in my head. I've got to do something every day that was um, value added to the market. Um, and I'm glad I did because it got in, I think I got in at the right time and, and, and it's been a, it's been an amazing journey since now we've got, we're working with about 200 brands around the world. Um, a big, big presence in Australia. We've got a huge off, obviously like 70% of our business in the UK. And then we've got clients in, in Ireland, in Holland, in Singapore, Bangkok. Um, yeah, Dubai, we've got clients in, in, we're still, we're yet to crack America, but I don't think we, I don't, we're not, we're not focusing on that yet. Yeah, but I'm sure it'll come organically with the people mm. that watch and listen on the on the podcast. You've got the rag podcast, of course. You've got your yeah, yeah. channel and, and it'll just grow through um, organic growth, I, I imagine. So from what you see of what's happening in the recruitment world right now with COVID, we've probably got a similar client base then. We're, we're both speaking mm. to recruitment business owners. That's our, you know, we're trying to solve their problems together, aren't we? So yeah. how do you think COVID has impacted them in terms of looking at their brands and their marketing? Interesting. I mean, like everyone, we feared the worst. Um, I was in, as I said, just come out of my third year anniversary, just presented to the whole team. You know, we were a five day a week London based business. Yeah. And um, we had one guy that was working remotely and we had a few freelancers that were like, you know, five days a week kind of people, but remotely. So we did have this kind of blended and I started working a couple of days from home a week and we would, we already had all the tools and systems set up to remote. So when it hit, I, I massively underestimated how long this would be. I was like, you know, it's a couple of weeks. So sent close the office and I mean, we never, we never went back. Um, but across my client base, probably got about, I don't know, probably about 50% of my clients called within the first three days and just wanted to find out what was going on. Like, asking you know what others were saying and it was very uncertain and then we saw quite a lot wanting to you know we didn't lose it i think we lost one or two clients max some asked us to be a bit creative with our pricing models and things like that but what most people figured out was that 
actually more than ever social media marketing was important because you can't compare it to the last recession because it, one social wasn't the, the same then but two when it's in when it's an economic crisis financial crisis that does not stop you getting in front of people you can still go and meet a client for coffee or go and physically sit with them but when you're when you're blocked from seeing everyone you know this was a completely different what this went this was everything meant we had to we had to operate online so you know we flip i remember ripping up about 25 client strategies that were all designed around like x campaign and we were like we're going to run webinar series we're going to run podcasts we're going to create digital assets for these businesses and this was in march like we just flipped it we ripped it up um which was insane um i didn't furlough my team we just we, we worked more hours we went mental for clients. <laughs> yeah we just went for it and it was um it was great uh, we got one client got eight thousand attend no twelve thousand webinar attendees between uh, march the first and, and june the 30th which is Incredible. this was a client that had never run a webinar would and they never, were, it would never have got that many people through a door to a seminar no. So exactly. And, and they're known for being that kind of, you know, they saved their little market from when it came to information. So um, on the whole, it, it, I saw an, it, it was an obvious increase in LinkedIn mm. massively. And then, and then as, as a result of that, you know, we've seen now people have started to get some really good results from it, which means they're investing even more. And um, it's, it's, it's been, a, it's been an interesting ride. I, like I said, I think it, depending on the sector, obviously, if you recruit in hospitality or education or whatever, you've had some really hard times. There's no denying I feel for every one of those people, but majority of the customers we were working with anyway, were, were in your sort of technology and medical and, um, you know, really high level recruitment roles. I don't feel like they've been affected that much yet. Yeah. Um, there will be, if this carries on, there's going to be some negative connotation, but at the minute I feel like the, the industry's rolled it well. Like we're, we're talking about a, an industry full of entrepreneurs, people that are just go getters that are going to make it happen. Like they're going to make shit happen, most of them. So we don't, we don't have a, our laurels generally as as individuals. No, nah, we? we're not going to hide. Great. So I've lo- one of the biggest things I love about my job is that my clients are entrepreneurs. I think it's amazing because in my previous role, I used to recruit for big corporate insurers, and all my clients were like senior managers. They were they didn't have any deci- real ownership or decision making capability. Yeah. So. Now I get to work with people that are like, you know, similar age and similar mindset to me and they want to grow businesses. And it's, I just love it. I love listening to them. I love finding out their challenges. I love, I love impacting it. That's the plan. And you can be nimble as well when you're dealing with an entrepreneur and you are that business owner, you can just decide and like that, that client decided really quickly to pivot into a webinar and, and you sort yeah, of yeah. Uh, and, and yeah. you talk about mindset. And for me, as I, you know, I've been a little bit reflective this week in terms of, you know, if we are heading into this sort of possible sort of second lockdown, as a, we, we don't know because Ireland are in it and Wales are in it, it's, mm. it's probably coming. You know, how, how have I, what have I learned over the last seven months? What would I change? And actually, I genuinely think that I'm a different person to the person that sat, sat there in March. I was actually in Italy when March, when mm. Italy went into lockdown in, back in March. And really? And, and in a way, obviously, no one would have wished this on anybody, but you've got to look at your mindset and think, like, what have, what have I benefited from? And I think it is understanding the micro parts of you, what makes you tick. You know, for me, it is about health. It's about fitness. It's about food. It's about sleep. Rest, yeah, massively, yeah. Pod- I mean, I'm obsessed with podcasts. And, you know, Monday to, th- Monday to Friday, I don't listen to music. When I walk the dog, I listen to podcasts. And I'm always sharing it. And I think it's so important. And you and I do share a mindset. I think that's why we've connected so mm. well. So what are your coping strategies? And, and then from those coping strategies, how would you, what would you recommend other people do to ensure that they've got a strong mindset going forward? Yeah, I think, I think depending on like, if, if we're aiming this conversation at people that are leading businesses, right? Well, I guess I found it's, it's a fine line between being vulnerable to your team, mm-hmm. but making sure you're the leader of the team, right? So not pretending everything's always all right because they'll see through it and think it's bullshit. Yeah. But, but at the same time, you, you, have to, you have to be the person that, you know, keeps everyone going and, and you can't wait. So what I did was I decided that literally, I remember the week, the week I shut the office was the week before lockdown got officially, like everyone got told to stay at home. So I did like probably an extra week. And, and that is funny. I kept going to the local, the park where I was living at the time. I'm not there anymore. Had a little bar in it. And I'd go to the park, walk my dog, sit there and have a pint of Guinness, looking over the water and just thinking, 
fuck are we going to do here? And I did that like four days in a row. <laughs> and I was like, I'm not a big drinker anyway. And I've had loads of ups and downs with, not ups and downs in terms of my um, like effects of it, but just with my drinking habits. I just, I just knock it on the head a lot. But I, rem- I remember feeling like, you know, I've had four pints of something one afternoon or one evening. It was about eight, nine o'clock. I was pretty, I felt upset about what was going on, I think. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I can't keep doing this. No. I was like, I'm not going to fucking do this. And I'd, I'd read about this, this challenge called 75 Hard about a year before. Right. And I, I, I loved the, 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 and in fact, I listened to a podcast about it and I loved it. And it was like this, it was the 75 day challenge where you had to do a, five rules every day. You had to drink a gallon of water every day, which I'm, I'm still doing. This is half gallon. I drink two of them a day, right? Um, you have to train twice. You have to do two 45 minute workouts. One of them has to be outside. Okay. You have to stick to a diet, which involves no alcohol and no cheap meals. You can, you can eat kind of however you want, as long as it's within a, within a framework. Um, you have to read 10 pages of a business book every day. Okay. You, have to take a pro, you have to take a progress pick every day. Oh. Um, so yeah, I, think that, I think that's the five rules, right? So I decided on March, at the end of March, I was going to do it. March 30th, I said, fuck it. There's literally, in my whole life, I've always had someone's birthday, a party, an event, something's happening. I could see 75 days at least. Everyone was saying, you know, we'll probably June, July, we'll come out of this. I was like, there's no way I've got a social event coming. So I was like, I'm going to do it. And I did it. And I, it was unbelievable. Like I didn't have a, I, I said, I cannot afford to have one off day in the next 75 days. I can't afford, I can't afford to wake up on over. I can't afford to feel shit so that my, let my team down. And like I said, we didn't furlough anyone. Our client base was stable enough. We worked our absolute balls off. I, I went daily with the podcast. So I did five podcasts. Some weeks I did six podcasts. I think I did 11 in week one and then just give me a buffer. Yeah. So I'm trying to be this guy that's got my team. I'm trying to, um, and I'm trying to support the industry with daily news. And, and I was like, I can't let, I can't let that can't go. Let I've got, I've, yeah. And, and I've got this big thing about like not letting people down. I, I really, I don't know. It's, I think that's what actually drives me is fear of failure. So I said, I'm going to do it. And I did it. And, and I remember getting up early and I woke up really early and I trained and I, ate and I lost like five, six kilos in that period. And I felt, I just felt un- unbreakable. I, I was felt just, amazing. You felt invincible, didn't you? Yeah, pretty you much. And I did a video. Well. Yeah, but you slept well and everything. Yeah, I, don't, I mean, I did a video on LinkedIn at the end and uh, I got a load of, you know, a load of people involved. And it's funny, I actually had a, I had an accident halfway through it. Well, not an accident. I did it. I was working out one day and it caused a blood clot in my back. So I had oh this like, God. I had a lump pop up. I had to go to hospital. They thought it might be cancer. This was all happening during COVID. And I'm like, oh, so that, you know, they were like, we think it's a blood clot, but there's potential. It's a, it's a muscular cancerous tumor. And I was like, what the fuck? So, but luckily, do you know what I told you? You have to take a, foot, a progress pick. Yeah. Well, I took a photo of my backside and front every day for like 60 days. Wow. So I knew this lump wasn't there three days before. So in my back of my mind, I was like, it's definitely the injury. It's an injury. Yeah. And it, and it turned out to be the blood clot. So it was, it was good. But so that not only was I worried about my business and everything economically and, and, you know, health of family, I lost my uncle, my mum's cousin passed away in the first month. Um, he was in Manchester Royal Infirmary with cancer, but he caught COVID and that killed him. So I'm dealing with all this. Then I got my own health scare and I was like, I just remember sitting there in June thinking, you know, it can't get much worse than this at times. Like you've, but if you can get through this mentally, did your team know that vulnerability? Did you share that with them or were you kind of keeping No, nah, I didn't tell them about my health stuff. No. I told them after. I don't know. Did they even tell them? After? I think I told them after. I think they knew I was, I took a couple of days off to go to the doctors and hospital right. and stuff. Um, but no, nah, I didn't tell them that. I told my business partner. Um, yeah. And, but I, 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 I think similar to what you said, but I think I don't know if it was on air or off air, but I just live by a rule that I'll try and control what I can control. Like I wake up in the morning and I'm like, look, there's so many things I can't control. Um, but I'll, I'll be positive enough about the things I can control and try not to let my mind go into like these dark holes. And it works. I think also I write down like five things a day now that I'm going to try and do. And that is it. Like I, I can't go more than that. I call it, there's a, the guy who did that 75 hard, he calls it a power list. Okay. So every day I wake up, uh, I, I mean, I've, I know what it's going to be the night before, but I write it down every morning on purpose and I say, right, that's my five things today. Okay. And, and well, then, you know, and it can be... Work things or are these five yeah. holes that you want no, to no, do? This is five work, five work things. Um, I mean, it might, might be one of them, might not be, but majority of five, five work things because 
when you're running a business, we've got like 20 staff now, or we will do at the end of this month. You know, it's a lot of, you get a lot of questions, 200 clients, 20 staff, you get a lot of questions like nonstop Facebook groups, emails, WhatsApps. Um, you know, we've got a Google chat internally. Like if you give your time to everyone on their terms and I've done that, it burns the shit out of you. Like I had to have a week off in July cause I was burnt. I was gone. I was mentally, like, I couldn't process information. I was like, I need a week off. But what I've got to the point where now is I go, right, I'm going to do them five things. And if, as long as I get them done tonight, I'll be all right. I can go and I can sleep and I can chill. And, um, and sometimes I'll move, I will let things roll over. Like sometimes people say, don't ever, what can be done today? Don't leave to tomorrow. It's like, that's bollocks. If you can mentally save some energy to, to something that can be done tomorrow without causing any impact, yeah. don't panic. <laughs> Just get through three to five things a day that are important that you can't leave till tomorrow. That's my kind of, mindset now and, and i also learned more than ever because because we're in this digital world where you can't just shout over a table i've learned to diarize things that are important whereas before i'd be like i'll just get around to it whereas now i'm like now nah, i've got because people suck your diary up like every five minutes someone's trying to put something in your diary i'm like you know i've got to get a service for my car like that is going in the diary i'm, I'm gonna book it at two o'clock on tuesday because that's my window like, you know, i remember once doing uh, this is years ago saying to a really an, an equally busy client can we book in a call and, he, and he, i remember them being not snotty with me but saying how ridiculous and i said but actually it means we know we're both because we can book together yeah and, sort of, and you know that is how i live my life i literally book in every prep call i book yeah. in calls I, I book in calls to friends a booking calls to, I know, I know I need to speak to the accountant. You schedule things. Actually, I bet you're like me. I bet you dead calm. I'm never. Well, that's it. That's it. Do you know what? I was, I was already pretty good at the work side. So like we went, we, we turned our sales process into like a video sales for about a year ago. Mm -hmm. So we, we found that last summer, 2019, we were spending so much time on the tube on trains that could we get more zoom? So we started to say to clients now, we don't, we don't just come and meet you anymore. We'll do a zoom first. And it, we got a bit of friction at the beginning, but we ended up, our business started going like that and it was great. So I was already used to the back-to-back -back nature of booked calls more than before, but I wasn't booking anything personally in my diary. Like that was just my, my, my yeah. I'm still a little bit shit with my personal life. Like I, yeah. I give so much at work that, you know, you get bills coming through. Like I can afford to pay the bill. I just haven't been asked to do it. <laughs> and you're going to get like, you're going to be like caught soon for like not paying your electricity bill or something. But, uh, I do, I am getting better at, at Mm. I, I've really learned that, you know, and, and it is, you have only so much mental capacity. If you, if there's something niggling you that you haven't diarized, yeah. that'll eat you away. But if, yeah, you can, if you can say, well, I know I'm doing that tomorrow. I've already got time for it. You can start to relax a bit and go, well, but, but for the people, the whole, for our, our shared audience, which is, is probably going to be an SME business owner who is, you know, got the facade, everything's great, but letting everything slide in their personal life, maybe not delivering the appraisals that they need to, they're, they're literally pulled from pillar to post. Actually, diarizing things means that you can't, and diarize time for yourself. I literally, I mean, I do set, I'm, I'm a crazy woman that sets her alarm at 5 a.m. because it means then I've got an hour before I even need to think about you know, I mean, my daughters are old enough to get up, but I do get them up in the morning. I stir these teenagers that don't want to get up. It means I can walk the dog for an hour. It means it's all really calm. And I just think that's a huge life hack for anybody. Just make time for yourself every day because yeah, it's, yeah. Just, it's giving something back, but it means then you are, you've got more to give other people, doesn't it? Yeah, I agree. I you know, agree. That, I think the, the, the lack of commuting as well has changed. <sighs> it's bought an extra what 35 40 maybe an hour's time in the morning to people um which you know as long as you're using it well it's really beneficial it's funny i went to london last week no week before mm. and um to see my team for the first time and saw the office and stuff because we've got our leases ending in november so we've we've been paying it but we, no one's been there really um and it was weird, like it was great, but it was it was really difficult getting on. We come a couple of meetings in in Central on the Tube, and it's a little bit exciting. But then I was a bit like, I've wasted the day. Like I've not done anything. Like normally I'd have had three three four meetings in that time. I've been traveling. So, three, four coffees. Yeah, now I know what nah, you mean. Not as many of them. Um, <laughs> so so yeah, I think the one thing I would look, I've I've said I, I've I've really realised, and I think I knew anyway, but I've realised is that variety is key. Um, Routine and variety, they're two, they, they, they go hand in hand, I think. Like, you need a routine that's consistent, but if you do five days a week, every week of the same thing, of just going to the office or just working at home, 
for me personally, I, I, I'm struggling with that. Like, I think at, towards the back end of before lockdown, I was doing one to two days from home or I'd work from the gym or I was getting away from five days in the office and I, I was really enjoying my time away and the time in. Yeah. And then I got locked to five days away and I started to hate that. No. So right. to me, it's finding that balance. I'm, still, I'm, I'm doing five days remote at the minute, so I'm, I'm not doing it yet, but I, I, I can't wait for the day I can do one to two days a week in an office with people and three days, you know, three to four days at home. I think that's the balance for me um, as, we, as, we, um, as we come out of this. And then we'll see once the world gets to some form of normality. Well, I can't I imagine I'll ever go five days in an office, but I'd like to think I'll balance it pretty well. Yeah, balance it and blend it. And I, again, I think that will really resonate with people because I think that's certainly from a recruitment company owner perspective, that's what they've mm. had. They're offering their, their staff with people need to feel connected and are more productive altogether. So what 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 inspires you in terms of podcasts? Are there any good shares for people that you listen to or Audible or any particular YouTube? Yeah, yeah quite a lot. Of, let me get my phone out. Let's have a look. Cool. Uh, when it comes to podcasts, there's a guy called Stephen Bartlett who... Oh. Um, Owns, diary, owns he, he just left social chain diary of a ceo i've always loved that podcast love how authentic it is um yeah there's one called uh feel better live more by a guy called um rangan dr rangan chattery i think is yeah it's chatterjee i really like his um podcast i listen to that it's very much a health podcast then there's a guy called james smith who's a personal trainer who has a podcast called fair point which is just a piss take chat with his, his mates which i think is pretty good right. um and then, obviously, the Rag podcast, which I, I, I don't listen to myself, but uh, I record it, so I don't need to. Do you not listen to um, Rag? Nah, never. I, I, I listen to every episode once to find the bits that I want to use for social, but I, don't, I would never go on the... I listen to it before it's even released in, like, Zoom footage. Um, so, yeah, and then Audible. What have I been through this year? I've done quite a few. So, Richard Branson's book, um, mm. Losing, Your, Losing My Virginity, I thought it was amazing. Um, Steve Jobs, I've started, but I lost the plot with that one. Didn't enjoy it. Um, when he was at university, it just went a bit too weird for me. Um, the 5 a.m. Club by Robin Sharma. Have you read that? Amazing yeah, book. I've got it on my bookshelf. <laughs> yeah. And then there's a book. There's a, guy, a couple of guys called The Minimalists who um, they've, got a, they, they, they've got a book called uh, Minimalism and a one called Everything That Remains, which is all about, it's actually quite relevant to lockdown. It's about how like, you know, how to live, do more with less, how to live a happier life without stuff. And, you know, I think depending on your habits before lockdown, you'll have realized that spending so much on clothes and shit that you, it doesn't actually matter, does it? Like it, it's all, it's all crap. And actually when you're at home all day and your house is full of shit, you can't use. I, I quite like the thought of, I threw away like about three grand of clothes, but in June, and now I've got a very, very bare wardrobe, but I quite like it. I'm gonna, I'll add bits and bobs here and there. But I, I put on really nice dresses, but I'll be sat here in my slippers on my Converse just because yeah. I've got my heels again. Yeah, no, it doesn't I'm matter. Like, oh, I'll have so, to listen to that. Yeah, minimalism is. It's a, I'm not a minimalist per se, but I think having less in your life, less clutter, less stress, less less things, mm. actually is is better for you. I think. I think it's good for your brain. So. Um, They'd be the main things I've listened to. Very uh, good. And then I've got a dog and I, I, you know, I'm trying to be more present a lot. And I think having time with your dog, like it's like kids and they're, they're just so good for being present. So you've got to, you have to be present for them. And uh, that, to hear you actually. He's trick trotting. I don't know whether he's just subliminally heard the word dog, but he's been asleep and he's just trotting. I've just locked him. I've just locked mine in the bedroom because he'll be going know. mental. He's been asleep all day. So he's, he's waking up now because it's just kind of his feed time. No, I agree with you. It's very good for your mental health to have. I think, it, again, it gives you structure. It's discipline. Mm. That's the key. I think that's really resonated through, through this interview, actually, that if you're disciplined in what you do, it just gives you that structure and that purpose. Well, I, obviously, you know, you're, you're, you're actually part of the academy. And, and the academy was something that I've, I've been planning for years, but I hadn't got around to doing. Um, and when lockdown came, I was like, I haven't got an excuse. I need to do this now. I wanted to coach more individuals rather than just brands. Um, and obviously when it came to it, I was getting calls from recruitment owners saying, Sean, I've not done BD in five years. I've furloughed my whole team. Like, I'm having to do this now. Can you give me any advice on what I could do on LinkedIn just to help? Yeah. So I was giving this stuff away and I was like, well, let's produce an academy. And so we've got what, 150 members now. Um, and we're soon to like, that's going to take off into its own format as a business now, hopefully it's been, but, but the big thing 
amongst all the stuff I teach around, you know, how to produce written content, video content, tell stories, the one ingredient that I would give anyone is consistency. Like it, I get people asking me, Sean, what's the best time to post on LinkedIn? Mm. What's the, you know, how long should the words be? Like there's loads and I'll give you my advice. I think I'd post between eight o'clock and 10 a.m. I think that gives you the most chance for people to see it throughout the day. Yeah. That, I mean, I posted yesterday and it bombed on LinkedIn. I posted it in the afternoon. So that Don't might know. be a factor. But I've had days where I've done it in the morning. It hasn't worked as well. Yeah. Um, my honest advice is whilst I think it's really important to test, refine, be obsessed with getting better, like you have to look at those marginal gains. You have to just fucking show up every day. Like, yeah. Because it's a bit like passing your driving test and then worrying about the horsepower of, a, of an engine. Like, you just fucking drive for a bit. Just get good at it. You, you mentioned know? Stephen Bartlett. I listen to his, I do listen to the diary of and I listen to his, um, he, he talks, the analogy of brushing your teeth. It's mm. that consistency every day. Because if you just go one day where you don't brush your teeth, okay, you're a bit skanky, but you're not going to lose your teeth. No. If you did that every day for a year, you are going to end up with serious tooth decay. You're going to be ripping them out. Yeah, it's exactly. And then and it's fitness, look at you. Look at your body, look at your savings. You know, you put, you put um, £10 away a, a, a day for five years and the compound interest and all the rest of it. I mean, it, it, it adds up. If you go to the gym once for 20 minutes yep. a day, every day for a year, you're going to look like a different person. Go and have an amazing gym session twice a week. You're not going to be that different. And that is the one ingredient amongst all of this. When it comes to social, I was five days a week pretty much every week since I started Hoxo and I just showed up and I had the confidence to, to, to put myself out there. Sometimes it was crap content. Sometimes I was, I'm embarrassed looking back at times. Um, but I had a clear audience. I knew who I wanted to talk to. I had something to tell them about. So I had a, I had a, had a, had a, had a vision for what I wanted to share and value I wanted to offer. And I just kept showing up and, and it really is, I think success in all areas of your life. If you're not consistent, Okay. you'll you'll have inconsistent results so it's that's the thing i've learned in lockdown like i couldn't keep the daily up on the podcast though I, that was that was a level of consistency that was unhealthy for me that just to yeah. do that every day i understand why i did that i was doing the same thing with with mm. youtube which then became the podcast and i was yeah. doing it every day some yeah. days three a day but like you say that was because i actually had very little else to do at the time <laughs> going on but now I'm doing, you know, we'll, we'll share, you know, some weeks it might be three or four and other weeks it might be one or two. It just depends. But I, it is, you know, something that you could, you could have the content there forever, but you can't keep it up. The thing, the thing that's interesting is I do think we fast forwarded in six months. We fast forwarded probably like three to five years in, in where the market was going anyway. Right. So, and I'm not one to say cold calling's dead. I don't believe it's dead. I think proactively going out after clients you want to work with and phoning yeah. them at their desk and all do it like crack on yeah. but spending hours and hours and hours hitting switchboards and that being your only route to engaging people in 2020 2021 i think is you you're behind the times and, and i think it frightens the older generations i think some people in their you know their 50s and 60s who have done recruitment for 30 years are like fuck that i don't want to change you know i can see the light at the end of the time. i can see retirement coming and i get it i, get, I completely yeah. get it but we're from a generation where we used to go and knock on each other's houses at night and we used to f phone the house phones of our friends Absolutely. to get through. Yeah. And we were doing BD as kids and we were all about face to face and meetings. And that was, whereas the, the generations now, they're used to messaging on app applications. They're used to, they used to video. They used to, you know, what do you mean call, calling someone's house? I'll just WhatsApp them. You, like, you, yeah. you get Snapchat. You get, a, you get exactly. a Snapchat from them. That's it. It's not, they don't even do WhatsApp. It's Snapchat. Well, exactly. So, but the point is, it's instant messenger. It's platform based. It's in a, it's a frictionless yeah. way that they, and they're, so that if we do not, as a recruitment industry, if we do not change, the, the, it, we're going to be trying to teach the generations that are coming through skills that, you know, skills that they don't have which is in some ways that's a benefit, but we're going to be teaching them things that worked 20 years ago when the things that work now didn't exist. Yeah. So we're just using our limited education to train people. Yeah. So my whole, my whole kind of mission is to upskill the industry so that the next generation get a fair crack. They get both, they get the old school stuff, which still works, but they get the new school as well. And, and well, you know, I'm you're going to create some well-rounded people in the future. Yeah. Cause hybrid. Um, yeah, why not? I mean, 
I, I was taught the old way. I, I, I know it works. I'm, I'm not sitting here going, ah, oh, never cold call, never make, you know, you, you don't need to meet people. It's all video. It's all, but I do think you need to adapt. Of course you don't. You need to adapt. You need and to I was saying it on, it. I said it on my LinkedIn live last week that it reminds me of the online dating world. Yeah. Um, I, I, I was on Tinder when I met Fids in 2014, right? And it had only just come out and I got in and I got out. As soon as I met her, I was out. Um, But I remember going from a world where you had to go out to try and meet someone and you had to spend 50, 60, 100 pound in a bar. You know, you'd have to have the balls to try and speak to people. You drink so you could do it. Um, And you might not come home with, you might not have met anyone. Um, And if you did, you won't remember what they look like. (laughs) <laughs> um, but to then having <laughs> this opportunity but then you had this opportunity to put a profile up and yeah. message you know you, I've been talking to five six people on the sofa on a Saturday night and not having to spend any money going out the benefits were great but and and, and, and I can see now like I've hired a t- teammate in South Africa one of them's moving to Barbados we can definitely now start hiring people globally the opportunity has gone not through safe. the roof just yeah. like that mm-hmm. however the problem of online dating was the commitment levels changed? People's messaging someone on an app wasn't daunting. You know, it didn't require me to look no, and have the balls. No, I had no balls to go over and speak to someone. So, with that, there was no investment in that conversation. You could yeah. be speaking to five, six, seven, and if a guy was speaking to five, six, seven, the woman's probably speaking to thirty, forty, fifty. Yeah, so, so you'd go on a date and go, "That was great," and then on the way home, that person could be messaging five more guys. Yeah, and. Like I say, I was grateful I got in and out at the time, but it was now when I, I keep hearing recruitment owners telling me about the, the the shift to more interviews, saying that you know the interview to placement ratios are just through the roof. That there's so many interviews going on, and the reason is the same thing. Candidates are going, yes, I will, yeah, in my underpants, zoom that company for sure. I'll meet the owner, I'll find out, and you know I might move, but. It ain't like taking a day off and getting ready and going across to London or Manchester and interviewing with that company. It's not the same commitment. So don't expect that. The points of commitment, which is a really old school way of training recruiters to make sure their candidates are commitment ready. One of the things was, do they turn up at that interview? What prep have they done? Have they got their brag file with them? Are they wearing a suit? Whereas now, they literally, they, they can actually still have their boxers on, sat at a Zoom, you know, with a blanket around the knees, you know, literally have their phone out with the website. They're not having done any prep. Exactly. And then look, it, it doesn't mean people won't get jobs. It doesn't mean it won't work. What it means is it's different and you've got to be different. As a recruiter, you've got to understand that and you've, yep. got, to, you've got to manage it better. You've got to control it and you've got to expect that the, the ratios are going, to, are going to shift. So if you needed five CVs to do a deal, you might need 10. Or yep. I, At the moment, as we all get used to this shit, you've got to adapt. Um, and so what I'm trying to say is it's, you know, it's, it, there are super amounts of opportunity going to come. The world is changing. Like we work went from, we spoke to them last month about their new uh, pass, which was a UK wide pass. So anyone you get, you, I think it's just under 300 pound a month. You can go to any we work in the country and you can work nine till five. I was like, that's brilliant. What about if I want to go on holiday? If I want to fly to Barcelona, Lisbon, you know, can I go? No. Two weeks later, now you can. Right. So they what they're trying they're obviously struggling uh, i don't know the numbers i've not looked at the share prices and things but they're clearly having to keep widening this opportunity and, and they're seeing opportunity with it so you know with this change and opportunity we'll we'll bring so many new amazing things but we need to be prepared that some of the things we we loved about our businesses and things that we were so ingrained with are gonna they're not they're not coming back or not coming back anytime yeah. soon but that ties in very nicely, you know, it's a nice finishing point. It's you've got to have a change mindset. And if you don't, you're going to really struggle going forward because it's going to continue to change. As we, as we record this now in October 2020, and someone might plug in and watch this in three months' time, who mm. knows what the world will look like then? We just don't know. Well, do we? You can invite me back on and we can talk about yes, it then. Yes, can. Well, we'll do it in person. I can meet your dog then. Seeing yeah, as you're yeah, Manchester. Let's, let's get it set up. Let's get it set up. Oh, it's been so lovely. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're really grateful and uh, all the best and we look forward to seeing you again soon. No worries. Thanks for having me on. And, uh, and if anyone is, you know, is, is on LinkedIn and wondering 
what the hell's going on, just drop me a, drop me a direct message on there. I'll always come back to you. It might take me a day or so, but that is the best place to get me if you want any more info, um, whether it's about our services or just you know advice and what, what the hell's going on. Hopefully, I can, uh, I can direct you in, into, the right, into the right place. Yeah. We'll make sure everything's on there as well to share across our social media channels. So definitely start following Hoxo and get in touch with Sean. Thank awesome. you so much. Take care. Thank you. Yeah, bye.